Hello, everybody. Welcome to Holly Randall Unfiltered, where we do a deep dive into the world of adult entertainment and beyond. I'm your host, Holly Randall, a 26-year veteran of the industry, and each week I bring you insightful interviews with some of the biggest names in the industry. This isn't your typical podcast. We are not afraid to get real and raw about topics that are often considered taboo. And as a special treat to our listeners, all episodes of my podcast is also streamed live on Patreon. By subscribing to our Patreon, not only will you have access to these exclusive live streams, but you'll also get access to bonus podcast materials, behind the scenes of my photo shoots, and so much more. Your support on Patreon allows me to continue doing this podcast, so make sure to come check us out at patreon.com slash Unfiltered. And if you're listening to us on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe. So let's introduce my guest today. Known for her fierce determination, film artistry, and intolerance to bullshit, she has reshaped the landscape of adult entertainment as we know it today. I am referring, of course, to none other than Kelly Holland, one of the most respected figures in her industry and a wealth of information and knowledge, and I'm so privileged to have her here today. Hey, Holly. Hi. Someone forgot to turn their phone off. Not me. I don't think. (laughs) You know what's funny is I'm always the one, like when we're filming, I'm always the one who forgets to turn my phone off. That's because you have so many other things to think about. That's why. Okay, thank you. So I have an intolerance to bullshit. I didn't know that. Yes. Do you know, I was just talking about that today. You're like, you don't put up with anything. I was just talking about that today. When people meet me, they always say, I found you so intimidating and you're you're really scary. And I always go, really? Because I'm so nice. I'm so (laughs) freaking nice. But I think, I, and so I've been pondering it. Why do people say that? And why are people intimidated by me? And I think it's, I think it's that I'm um, ironic and cynical in a way, or I, I, I can kind of say things that are meant as a joke, but they cut and people feel that. Or maybe I just don't put up with, I have an intolerance for bullshit. Maybe I think it's that. <laughs> I mean, you have a really strong personality and you have like a commanding presence, right? And I think that a lot of people find that intimidating, especially in a woman. Mm. Um, but you are nice. Like, you know, you I've shot at your house many times and things have gone wrong and you're always incredibly reasonable about stuff. Like I've never seen you lose your temper. I've never seen you lose your shit. Um, you're always very calm and collected about everything. But- you're also somebody who I feel like if I tried to bullshit you, you'd be like, Sh- shut up. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I might, I might. I developed this this belief when I was, when I owned Penthouse and when I was a president of Penthouse, that if I lost my temper, I lost. Like mm. I lost the game if I lost my temper. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, but it's probably a good thing I don't own a company right now because I remember, and I was thinking about this when I was talking about being a little bit sarcastic. So I used to say to people, people would come to me, employees, I had about 30 employees and somebody somehow screw something up and they'd come to me and they'd say, yeah, but I thought, and I said, hold that, hold that. I don't pay you to think because you don't do it well. I think you do what I, I used to say shit like that. I didn't, I don't know that I really meant it, but it just sounded funny. See you laughing. Nope, not your job. Don't think, not your job. I'm laughing, but but I feel like if you said that to me, I don't think I would be laughing. (laughs) I think I might be crying a little bit. So sometimes you just have to deliver the punchline because it sounds good. But then I, in retrospect, look back and probably go, oh, that was not a good thing to say. That was really cutting. But anyway. Well, Point of the story is I'm super nice. And <laughs> if you ever meet me, do not be intimidated because I'm really chill. And I mean, look, you know, like that also comes through with like your love of animals and the way that you, you know, try to protect and take care of the weak and the unfortunate. I used to do that with people. And it was, was such a losing situation. <laughs> it's always Don't even <laughs> ask me the story about Randy Spears that trying to save Randy Spears. What's so. the story about Randy Spears? You've never heard the story about Randy Spears? No. God bless him. I love him. I mean, he's he's just a he's just a searcher, just a guy trying to get through. And uh, I'm happy all. he got through this this business. But he had a very substantial chemical dependency for quite some time. And he called me one time. I'm trying to make this story as condensed as possible. That he was at um, Free Speech Coalition. There had been a, a case of HIV, and they were having this big you know crisis meeting at. Uh, whatever the Marriott or whatever it was in the Woodland Hills. And he called me a few hours before the meeting and he said he was there, he was in a room, but that there were Italian mobsters that were the relatives of his wife 
or girlfriend or something that were down in the lobby that were so incensed that she was dating a porn star that they were trying to they were going to kill him, kidnap him and kill him. He sounded complete as as irrational as that story is. He sounded reasonable, mm-hmm. which is one of the things that drug addicts are really good at. And could I come down and get him out? Oh, okay, okay. Last time I checked, I wasn't the FBI, but sure. So I go down there and knock on his door, and he's like, "Who is it?" I said, "It's, it's Kelly." are you sure? I'm like, last time I checked, yes, you called me. (laughs) So the door opens, I walk in and the room is like a scene from hell. There's every single surface was sticky with lube. Uh, There were stockings hanging everywhere. I don't know if you remember that he had a foot fetish, leg fetish kind of thing. Okay. There was a VCR ripped out of its uh, cabinet and a new one had been put in. There was porn everywhere. There was toys everywhere. It was just like, it was like hell. And I just stopped and went, what the fuck? And I looked at him and you could see from his eyes, he was completely high. And I said, okay, we need to get you out of here and we need to get this stuff packed up because they're going to arrest you for this. And so he was like, okay, 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 okay. I said, get your shit together, get your stuff, and we're going to walk out. And he said, okay, okay, I, just, I, I think I should get something to eat. And I said, well, you can't have room service coming up here. Hmm. And he goes, I'll pack everything. You just go. Can you just like do drive through and get me something? I said, sure. And he was pretty rational at that moment. So I go out like a dummy and I get something and I come back and I knock on the door. Who is it? Uh, It's me with your cheeseburger. Uh, How do I know it's you? I I was like, oh, here we go again. He had whatever drugs he had, he had done them again. Yeah. This went on through a couple of sessions. And I realized at one point as I was sitting there and he was so not himself and I handed him a bottle of water and he looked at it and he went, what did you put in this? And I went, "Oh my God, dude, you saw me pop the cap. I realized at that moment he could have killed me and not even known that he was doing it. Anyway, I get him out of there and I get him to my house at like three in the morning. And I said, you're leaving your bags in the car. Lift your tongue, doing the kind of prison thing. Mm-hmm. Don't have drugs in your mouth. I patted him down, not in his pockets, not anywhere, right? I said, okay, I'm going to sleep on the couch because I'm going to get up at six in the morning. You go in my room and just sleep this off. Oh, yeah. And his mom was visiting. <laughs> his mom didn't know where he was. Next morning, I go to the gym. I come home. I'm expecting a sober Randy. He's in my bedroom and the door is locked. And I said, Randy. He goes, who is it? I said, it's fucking <laughs> Kelly Holland. I'm here in, in my, my house. house. <laughs> and uh, he goes, get away from the door. I have a shotgun. Well, I had a shotgun. And that, I realized later that he did have drugs and they were up his bum. That's how committed he was. And that ended up with me. Remember Shylar at Vivid? Yes. It ended up with me. And I don't cry. I think I've cried like three times in my life. Probably the day I was born and maybe two other times. I I hear a big hydraulic truck out front and I go out, there's a fire truck. And I'm like, why are you here? We got a call that there's an incident here. I said, what? He had called them to tell them that my gardener was burying bodies in the backyard because he saw him digging. I, I had to, they wanted to come in and he had a shotgun locked in my bedroom. And I thought, you know, if I let them come in, they're going to kill him in my, it was a brand new house. So it tells mm-hmm. you it was like 20 years ago in my house. And I, I don't know how I talked this captain off the ledge, but I said, you cannot come in. I've got this under control. You're going to escalate a situation. Please, God, please. He said, I'm coming back in 15 minutes. I remember calling Marcy Hirsch and I just started crying. He's in my room and he's got my shotgun in my The police were here. The fire department was here. She goes, I'm sending this to Shylar. Charlie came over and we finally opened the door, got him out, and I walked in my room and every surface was sticky and my stockings had been pulled out of the drawer <laughs> and my letters from somebody I was dating in Europe were laying all over the place. And that was probably the last time I really helped somebody with a chemical dependency. And he was so apologetic a, a couple of days later. Now, he's out of the business. He's become religious. He's got a wife. He's, you know, by whatever means necessary. Yeah. But that was where I really realized I was not doing animal rescue at the time. And I really realized I just, human Cats are so much easier. Yeah. Cats, <laughs> dogs, horses, squirrels. 
And, uh, you know, that's when I just got so clear that people have to make that decision. People have to own their stuff. You can't, it doesn't matter how much you love them, how much you care for them, what you're going to do. I just think about parents who have children that go off the rails and have substance problems and the fact you have to walk away. Yeah. Nothing you can do. Yeah. I mean, you know, I tell people this all the time because, you know, I've got six years of sobriety and I was a a very bad alcoholic. I never had a serious drug problem like that. I was never in a situation like with Randy, but it took me a while. And it was just like, I had to be ready and I don't know what made me ready. Uh, I actually had seven years of sobriety and then I relapsed. And on accident, it's a long, boring story, but I relapsed on a shoot in Costa Rica with twisties. <laughs> I accidentally, ate an, push you I accidentally ate an edible. But I was also extremely stressed out. Yeah. And then once I ate that edible, I got a case of the fuck it's. And I was like, well, I'll start smoking pot. And then I smoked pot for a while. And then it led to drinking. Anyways, four and a half years. And I spent four and a half years trying to get sober again, like going to meetings like all the time. And it was weird because it was like, I knew how much better life was on the other side, being sober. Like I knew that that's what I wanted, but I still like couldn't get there. Like the, the addiction had me, it kept pulling me back, right? And, um, so when I finally like got it, I got it. And I remember a friend of mine who was in the program and I asked him, I'm like, when am I like going to get sober? Like, I want to get sober. I'm trying, I'm going to meetings, like I'm doing all the things. And he said something that I'll never forget. And he goes, alcoholism is like being fucked by a gorilla. You're done when the gorilla is done. <gasps> and I was That's like, great. okay, so I just got to keep trying and like, and it'll just, I'll get there eventually. And I did, but I tell people all the time who are struggling, you know, who have family members that they love, you know, you talked about parents and I think about what I put my parents through. Um, and you know, I've had friends who've, whose children or close family members have died from addiction and, you know, they always blame themselves. And I always tell them there's, it's not your fault. There's nothing you can do because if that person doesn't want to get sober, it doesn't matter how many rehabs you send them to. It doesn't matter how much money you spend on their recovery, how much you love them, you know, whatever you do, like they have to want to get there. You can't take that journey for them. And that's such a hard thing to accept. You can't love them more than they love themselves. And until they get to that position, do you know, maybe you don't know this and I'll tell you why I know it in a minute, but on average- 13 attempts to get through. It's probably a little different for alcohol versus uh, meth versus whatever drug, but on average in addiction, 13 times you fail before you get through it. Mm. The reason I know that is it's weird, so I know. So at one point in my career, I was the creative director for Playgirl, and that was before Penthouse. And I loved the job. Um, and while I was there, I noticed that every time I would go to dinner with, we call them civilians, people that are not in the industry, Mm -hmm. it would take about three minutes before someone at the table, it didn't matter whether men or women, generally better if it was not mixed company, it's just a table of men or just a table of women, would say, wow, you're in the adult industry. That must be so weird. Well, no, no, not really. Uh, So they would always have the same question, men or women. So do those girls really have orgasms? Now, if it was a woman, a group of women, I would say, I don't know, do you really have orgasms? And that would start a conversation that would go forever. If it were men, I would say, I don't know, does your wife really have an orgasm? (laughs) Yeah. And I would just say, yeah, okay, you hold on to that Uh, thought. Sure. (laughs) Um, And that would start a conversation about, about what should have been this, you know, you're married, you're sleeping next to a person, that person is guarding you with their life, that is the most intimate situation, you'll have a child with that person, you will share all things with that person. But generally, even today, women fake their orgasms, can't bear to tell their husbands for fear that it will emasculate him or whatever, or that they will be, it'll bounce back on them as being somehow less than. And men make the assumption that they know what they're doing, which they don't, and on and on and on the facade goes, right? So. This is almost 20 years ago with Playgirl. So I thought, you know, at that time, Psychic Hotline was huge. It was a billion-dollar industry. And I thought, you know what? Every woman at that table I've ever talked to and a million more out there need a call-in line that is like Psychic Hotline but is a true value where they have coaches who can talk to them about their intimacy issues. 
Well, I never ended up doing it because it was a great idea. I talked to investors. Everybody was kind of hot for it. But then I left Playgirl and I got pulled into Penthouse immediately. And that was such a seductive brand and it, it needed so I'm a fixer upper at heart. I am a total fixer upper, save, savior, recreate thing person. And Penthouse was just, I could see it, you know? I'm one of those people that can look at a, a huge mess of stuff and just go, okay, if this goes here and that goes there, like I can sort it and reconstruct it into a beautiful thing. And Penthouse was just so seductive in that way. So once again, I put it to the side, even though it kind of paralleled some of the penthouse properties, which were penthouse letters. You know, after there was the the Kinsey report, there were penthouse letters, people talking about their fantasies, writing about their fantasies, and generally very forward to its time. And then there was Penthouse Forum, which was educational. So it sort of paralleled some things we were doing in penthouse. And I kept saying, I will do it inside penthouse. But by this time, everything was digital. Mm. So I was going to do this thing called my intimacy coach. I may still do it. God, I'm hoping for reincarnation because I have so many things on my list I want to do. I'll never get them done. Please let there be reincarnation. I can get my punch list finally finished. So I was going to do my intimacy coach. I may still do it. It just turned out to be really expensive, like a million dollars up front just to do the technology platform. But it was online counseling and coaching, very much like talk space, very much like better help, but focused on intimacy issues. I still think it's a brilliant idea. But what I thought is there's an economy of scale. So if you're going to spend a million dollars doing this platform, don't just do my intimacy coach. I was going to do my recovery coach. Mm-hmm. And I was going to do that targeting mainly small towns where people might feel stigmatized to go into an in-person meeting. Mm-hmm. So they could do a digital meeting, an online meeting, choose to be in a Zoom situation where people saw them or just choose to participate and have their sponsors in that environment and have the benefit of having people that are outside of their small community so that there is no blowback if people don't know that they have a substance problem, probably more more for chemical dependencies than alcohol. And then I was also going to do just my crisis coach. I don't care what your problem is because just people just need somebody to talk to. Yeah. They so do. We live in a world that is so disconnected, so isolating. People just need to pick up a phone and talk to a human on the other side. Or um, their keyboard. I mean, this is why OnlyFans has exploded. Yes. People are like, I mean, a majority of the guys that I talk to about OnlyFans are just, they just want to talk about their day. Yes, they do. You know? Yes, they do. And- To kind of follow on with that about intimacy issues, if you talk to any escort, any good escort will tell you it's 10 minutes of sex and 50 minutes of talking. Yep. Because that person finally has someone that they can open up to. They won't judge them. Yes, won't judge them. That's the thing. That's my intimacy coach. That normal isn't here. Normal is big, big, big tent, you know? As long as it's consensual and it's legal, I don't, you know, 16% of all men have cross-dressed at some point, even if in jest, you know, but, you know, a man living in a small town, his wife goes to work. He likes to put her stockings and her her bra on. Who's he going to tell that to? Is he going to go to a therapist? Maybe that therapist, when he walks into that office and there's some snarky receptionist, hi, what are you here for? And then he's going to walk into that therapist. She might be the mother of a kid that plays soccer with his kid. If that person can have an anonymous, completely anonymous, and we were gonna, one of the reasons the technology was going to cost a lot was we were going to make it, I never say unhackable, everything's hackable, but we were going to basically tokenize it and blockchain it in a way that it would be so hard to get to the person. Mm-hmm. And, and they would even be protected from a coach, maybe a rogue coach that wanted to try to blackmail somebody. Mm -hmm. And so it would be completely anonymous. You wouldn't have the Ashley Madison effect. If you remember what happened with Ashley Madison, we would eliminate, that was one of the prime goals is eliminate the Ashley Madison effect. And um, I still think it's a, it's a brilliant idea. And I think that, I think anything that can bring people into a conversation where they're comfortable and where they can share their lives. Look, Facebook, I have 1700 friends. I I don't know. Maybe I know like 40 of them. I mean, 
you know, but it gives you, gives people the illusion that you have this tribe. Um, somebody came to me, they wanted to do, you know what LARPing is? <laughs> yes, I do. Why do you even know that? I learned LARPing from what we do in the shadows, the TV show. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So they want to do a whole kind of, uh, you know, post-apocalyptic zombie kind of get together where these people come from all over the country and they camp on the property and blah, 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 blah. So for those of you who don't know, LARPing is live action, action. role Play. play. Yeah. And it's basically where you pretend to be some kind of figure from, I don't know, Something. your favorite show or time. And everybody participates in that, like they're that person. If you've literally ever gone to like a Renaissance fair, like everybody who is there is LARPing. That's, that's where it started was actually Renaissance yeah. fairs. And now it's moved into coming off of gaming and, you know, initially Dungeons and Dragons, but now it's, it's all the sort of wasteland, you know, apocalyptic yeah. stuff. But today, Damien at New Sensations, who's at the house, said, this is stupid. And I said, it's not. I said, it's a tribe. Those people, yes, they game play. Yes, they're grown ups and they're playing games and they're pretending to be zombies or zombie killers, whatever it is. It doesn't really matter. But the bottom line is it's community. And in a world of f how many billions? Four billion? Are we? I feel I've like lost we're like many, double that. Seven billion? However many billion we are. In a world where we are constantly we're not reminded of this on CNN, that, the, that there's this huge world out there and we're just ants in the shoebox. We are desperate for community. We're desperate for closeness. We don't live close to our families generally, you, but I mean, but generally people move away uh, where we have lifespans where our, our families pass and, and people are just desperate to find that closeness that they used to have. Maybe, maybe that's what, I'm not going to get political right now, but maybe that's that's the call of returning of, of that conservative backwards movement is to go back yeah. to not the the bullshit of then, although yes, but because the fifties were a drag. But uh, so I read. I'm not that old, but uh, <laughs> but um, but to go back to that sense of community. You I know? agree with you, and it's so weird that you bring this up because I was literally thinking about this today as I was driving here, and I was thinking about community and how isolated people are. And by the way, we should actually probably talk after this podcast because I am working on a creator platform that is running on blockchain that is tokenizing users, mm. and I want to bring all kinds of sexual wellness and stuff into the space. So, oh, we should do this business together. Then yeah. I've already got a thirty-page business plan. I'll share it with you. <laughs> 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 so, but anyhow, um, and I was thinking about that and I was thinking about community and how mm -hmm. people are so lonely. And I am not a religious person in the least. I was actually raised an atheist, but um, I see the value that church has for Absolutely. people, that it brings people together. Absolutely. And it was the one thing that everybody did. Even my mom has talked about this. She's obviously not religious. It was the one thing that everybody did and you like kind of had to do, right? And then you would go and you would see everybody and it would bring everybody together. The 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 practice there of like worshiping an entity that was going to punish you if you didn't tell him he was great all the time is a little weird to me, but whatever. But I see why that's valuable. And I feel very <laughs> lucky, ironically, that I am an alcoholic and that I have a community that is very like accepting and I can go anywhere in the world and go to any meeting and I will be accepted with open arms. And I'm fortunate to have that. And that will be something that I will have for the rest of my life. If I ever feel lonely, if I ever feel alone, like I think about my mom, right? You know, my father died like a year and a half ago. And yes, like we live with her and we help take care of her, but like I can't be with her at all times. I can't, like I have a daughter, I have a job. And so, you know, like sometimes she's alone and I can see she's kind of lonely. And I think she's lost a lot of like her confidence and she doesn't really go out mm -hmm. and like see her friends too much. And we live in like this isolated place, kind of, kind of a little bit like you, where like we don't really have neighbors. Mm -hmm. And anyways, um, and I just think about how, you know, where I'm going to be when I'm her age. And if I was feeling lonely, well, I could just go to like, I could start going to meetings and I would have that there. And how, yeah, like what, how do you foster community for people who aren't religious, who don't want to go to church, which I get, I definitely wouldn't want to do that, who don't have a substance abuse problem, which I would not recommend getting. Like, where do you find that sense of community? And I guess it's We things do it in so many ways. Right. I mean, that's... You want to know where the culture moves. It moves to the needs of the culture, and that's such a basic primal need is, is for that tribe. So it moves to all of those kind of places of tribalism and, and sort of tangentially off of that, 
to, to penthouse and to all businesses and to the concept of being a fixer. I even I even look at things. I don't want to shade penthouse too much. It's I mean it's just so depressing and it's so it's collapsed under its under a lack of focus and attention. But that's neither here nor there. Anybody would expect me to say that since I no longer own the company. But this is crazy and totally off topic. But I think about Toys R Us all the time. How did they go bankrupt? How did they go bankrupt? If you think you can own any business right now that doesn't rely on a concept of some kind of community, why would anybody go to Toys R Us when you could order anything on Amazon? Well, you would go on a Saturday to do a kid's birthday party, or you would go take your five-year-old to play with Play-Doh and, and learn how to do different things with Play-Doh. You would, why do I know this? Because small toy shops did not collapse, but Toys R Us did because they had nothing other than sales to pull people. And I sit there and I think, where were all of those, C, the CEO and the C-suite that were being paid $300,000, $400,000, $500,000? And they didn't look at such basic things as, and this is what you look at in business, I think. It's what you should be looking at in business. You're looking at where the culture's going, why it's going there, and this is a big part of it, this isolationism, the fact that you can Amazon's eating up everything, so you have to give people an experience. It has to be an experiential retail environment. So you create those things. If they had had that, they wouldn't have gone out of business. And it just shocks me when I look at that stuff and go, it's so simple. It's so obvious. Why didn't you do it? It's, you know, it it's seems nutty. So, it seems so obvious now that you're saying this, but I wouldn't have thought of that. But now that you're well, saying I this said, out loud, I'm like, oh. That, I look at yes. blank walls sometimes and I just contemplate something. I don't know. Pick the subject. Pick whatever I just read in the newspaper. And I go, okay. So if this connects to that, and that, I just like see the pattern start to emerge and whoosh, 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 boom. Yeah. And then I go, why wouldn't they have done that? It's so obvious. Yeah. I could get off on why Red Lobster had a problem too, but it's not just that they were doing shrimp, uh, you know, all you can eat shrimp, but I won't because that's not what we're here for. <laughs> we haven't even gotten to question one, you know that. I know, we're 30 right? minutes in. I was Shit. just going to say, all right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about porn. I swear <laughs> to God, we are going to talk about porn. So stick around, we'll be right back. Hey there, guys, Holly Randall here. And today I want to tell you about something that's incredibly important on a film set and equally significant in the bedroom. Confidence, of course. With over two decades of experience directing in the world of adult films, I know firsthand how a little boost in confidence can make a world of difference for performers. Look, I have seen guys fail on set so many times, or even how a small hiccup can just shake their confidence. Trust me, it's more common than you might think. Everyone has a bad day. You too deserve to feel like the star of your own show. And that's where Blue Chew becomes a game changer. Blue Chew brings the same active ingredients found in Viagra and Cialis, but offers them in a convenient, chewable form at a fraction of the cost. This makes it more accessible for those who need a little extra support. Plus, the entire process is handled online, which means no awkward trips to the doctor or pharmacy. I understand how uncomfortable these conversations can be, and Blue Chew has turned it into a discreet, straightforward process that's overseen by licensed medical professionals. And here's the part that might steal the scene. We've got an exclusive deal for our loyal listeners. You can try Blue Chew completely free when you use our promo code HOLLY at checkout. Just cover the $5 for shipping. That's right. Head over to bluechew.com, enter promo code HOLLY, and you'll receive your first month for free. Visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. And a huge thank you to Blue Chew for sponsoring this podcast and supporting everyone in feeling like their most confident self. All right, guys, we are back to talk about porn. For real. <laughs> for real. Okay, so Kelly, let's, let's talk about your beginnings. How did you get into actual filmmaking first? Because you started off doing documentaries, right? No. I okay. started, I know it started with religion. Yeah. So, okay. So I dropped out of college in my first month. I was going to be a broadcast major and I didn't even get through a day of undergraduate before I saw an ad for a TV station looking for an audio engineer. And I thought, hmm, 
because I just jump down rabbit holes constantly. I'm like, hmm, let me just send them a, like I'll fake up a resume and just send it to them. They brought me in. The chief engineer was, I, I, there's no reason he should have hired a 20-year-old who basically knew nothing, but uh, except that I was tall and lanky and I was a model and he was probably a little bit of a lech. And he hired me as an audio engineer. And I was like, well, why do I need to go to school for four years? I just got a job in TV. <laughs> Happened to be, side note, Pat Robertson, Christian Broadcasting Network, uh, 700 Club. It was Dallas, Texas. He had a channel there, Channel 39. His main channel was Virginia Beach, but but they had just opened the, the or just launched the channel in Dallas probably a couple of years prior. So I was the infidel amongst them all, and they didn't know that at the time. I actually made much of the fact I'd gone to Catholic convent school, and he said to me, we won't hold that against you because you know, I was a papist. <laughs> anyway, so I did that for, for two years, and um, mainly because I they had prayer meetings every day, and I would I wanted to go to prayer meetings a couple of times because I was fascinated with people that spoke in tongues. I was trying to figure out how that happened and what the psychology of that was. And um, so this was, um, oh, what's the name of the, that kind of religion where they- Pentecostals. Pentecostal, yes, yes, yes. And the yeah. snakes, did they do the snakes? No, they didn't do the snakes. Oh. It, was, it was the middle of Dallas. It was a pretty big city. I don't think they had would bring snakes in. I think health and safety would have probably had a fit on snakes, but they did fall out. They did speak in tongues. They did fall out. Once I watched it for a while and couldn't figure it out, I would just go, I couldn't leave the building, but I didn't, they couldn't make me go to prayer meeting, but I would go hang out in my auto booth. And once a, one, about once a month, Harold Wheat, the manager of the, the general manager would come say, Kelly, God has impressed upon me that he would like you to come to prayer meeting. And I'd say, well, Harold, God has impressed upon me. He wants me to sit here and listen to Pink Floyd. So what is up with that? <laughs> and he would just say, oh, Kelly. I'm going to pray for you. I said, thanks. I need all the prayers I can get. Anyway, left. I was doing theater the whole time. And so like every little aspiring theater person in Dallas, Texas, I moved to LA. Had a you know a few years, not successful by any means as an actress. Theater and voiceovers. And hi, welcome to the 1982 Chevrolet, con you know, it's kind of trade show stuff to get by. So wait, so, sorry, because I am fascinated by the Pentecostal speaking in tongues. You never figured out no, like- No, I, I kept watching for the pattern to it and what would prompt it. And I do believe they go into a trance. I do believe that that's legit. I don't think they're faking it because it was too fluid for them to fake. And it was different people all the time, right? It was different people. There was probably just a few that would do it m most of the time, but- they would go into a trance, just like I've I've seen people in yoga and meditation basically trance out. And I just they go to somewhere in their brain. I don't know where. I don't think I don't think it's inauthentic. I just couldn't figure it out. Hmm. So I gave up. Okay. Uh, didn't want to spend too much time with it. So you know, whatever. Moving on. Came out here, actress. Ma 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 ma. And then I met a priest. <laughs> Uh, I was raised Catholic in a convent school, and so it, that was priests were kind of mm, influential to me in ways that I didn't even really want to acknowledge. And there was something going on in Central America. It was a it was a peace march in support of what was called the Contador Peace Plan at that time. Central America, El Salvador, Nicaragua, everybody was in absolute Guatemala. It was when the death squads were there, and the nuns had been murdered, and it was chaos down there. And these people from around the world were going to go march through Central America. And I said to this priest, I'd actually just gone out there because there was this guy in this band that was playing out there that I was cute, thought was cute and I was hustling. <laughs> there I was, you know, amongst all the Birkenstock crowd in my satin jackets and my high heels. But I went up to the priest, Blaise Bonpain, and I, at the end of the night, and I said, you know, what you're doing is really amazing. It's such a nerd when I look back on what I did. I go, Really, I hope somebody's going to do a documentary on this because it has such dramatic potential. And he he was just standing there with his hands like this. And he reached out and he took my hands. He said, I think you're the person to do it. And I went, oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm an actress. I, no, 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 no. I, I couldn't possibly. He goes, grab my hands again. He goes, I think you can do it. I'm going to introduce you to a woman who went down there. She didn't know anything about documentary. Well, anyway. I did go down. I gave up acting, which if you told me two days earlier, I would never have done. I gave up acting. And eight weeks later, I was in Central America with a crew. I had a little bit of production background because I'd worked at a TV station, but I surely was out of my element. And that would create a relationship. That documentary won awards. It was called Viva La Paz. No thanks to me, by the way. Just circumstances happened. And then I would work with this woman who 
he had told me about, Barbara Trent, the Empowerment Project. She would go on to do cover-up behind the Iran-Contra uh, affair, which was probably the biggest, mm, you know, when people talk about conspiracies, that was probably the most outrageous covert thing that had happened in 50 years. And then go on to win an Academy Award for a, a movie called Panama Deception, which was about the invasion of Panama. So became this radical leftist, which I'm still progressive, but I'm not a radical leftist. Um, the, I created a studio in El Salvador. So I had a studio called Art Attack. I created a studio there called Public Art to, to do commercial work during the day for the oligarchs, you know, insurance commercials, whatever the hell in El Salvador. And at night, though, we would do sort of subversive stuff, mm -hmm. you know, subversive, what's subversive? Healthcare for the poor, how to how to do healthcare for the poor or whatever, or how to organize for a union. And uh, when the rebels, uh, when the peace accords happened, I was there, I was up in the mountains with the rebels. And a couple of days later, we all came down to the Capitol and the rebel commandante Villalobos, commandante Villalobos walked into my studio and he said, very nice, compa. You have done a very good job. I will take this now. This will be mine. I was like, <laughs> what? So, oh, that's what socialism, that's what communism is. Anyway, so we would. I would work in that field for a long time and love it. Uh, I loved being at the center of a story, you know, the center of the news, not watching the news, but the center of the news. Mm -hmm. And I had a contract with Australian Broadcasting and a couple of Australian producers, and they were doing three documentaries on American culture. The first one was on the healthcare crisis. It was called Your Money or Your Life, and it was uh, much worse than it. You didn't have the ACH and Obamacare. Then we did one on guns called Critical Mass, which was very indicative of American culture, very specific to American culture. Then we're kind of casting around for what the third one was. By that time, I had edit bays, and I would just rent out my bays to anybody. And I had... Shishi LaRue working there with Jim Steele uh, on a movie called, it was for Vivid Men when Vivid did a gay line and it was called Prince Charming. But I didn't know. I didn't know who Shishi was. I didn't know who Jim was. I didn't know what Vivid was at the time. I just knew there were these kind of flamboyant guys in one of my edit bays, edit bay number three. And then they had something break and I went in there to fix it and all of a sudden, and I just, I'd never seen porn in my life. I'd, really? Not, no, not that I had anything against it. I just had never had occasion to watch any. Yeah. And I walked in and, you know, it was probably some guy getting blown or some f guy getting fisted or something. And I was just like, and they all looked at me and went, are you okay with this? And I went, yeah, sure. So I fixed whatever it was. And that started my relationship with Vivid because they started paying me and calling me and Marcy would call me to do... Uh, compilations, you know? Mm -hmm. okay. So they would send over their movies. And I called her one day and I said, I thought you guys were like the big dogs on the block. She said, well, we are. Because Viva was at its, at its, at its, at, at its um, apex at that time. It's a, yeah. And uh, I said, well, I had a movie here. It's a big movie of your shot on film. And the director is standing at the top of the stairs, like peeking around. It was PT. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I said, your editor forgot to cut that out kind of dummy, isn't he? And it's really pretty cheesy. And she said, well, you think you can do so much better? I said, well, yeah. And I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm sure I could do better than that. She said, fine, why don't you come in and try to direct a movie? Well, Steve Hirsch at that time, I believe probably most of his life, he's a very analytical guy. And I think he had I saw him interact with PT. He was a little awed by creatives. Like he didn't understand them. I think they he was afraid of them somehow. And so I come in kind of also a creative. And my first movie that they gave me was Blondage with Janine and uh, Julia Ann. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I think we had an earthquake in the middle of that movie. But we got through it. It was their top selling movie that I was year. Say, that's like a legendary thing. Had zero to do with me, had everything to do with them because they were legendary. Yeah. But of course, Stephen thought it was me, had that I had something to do with it because they thought it was some kind of creative auteur. Well, at least there wasn't and, a shot of you at the top of the stairs. And word left up on in the that, footage. Word so. up on that. And they gave me a seven year contract. And it was a wonderful contract. I did five movies a month. Three in video, two in film, which I never worked in film before. I loved working in 16 millimeter, even though it was really hard. And um, and I I loved it. And and it was just like a playground. It was like uh 
the a, a well-funded student film playground because you could go, oh, I think I'll do pyrotechnics on this movie, or I think I'll do squibs and guns on this one, or I think I'll do rain gags on this one. And it was just so much fun, and I learned so much. And then seven years later, uh, Gonzo came in, mm. and Steve called me and he said, I don't think you'd be good at Gonzo. I said, why? He said, you know, you do all the kind of romance stuff. I said, no, I don't. That's such a cliche. But he goes, we're hiring Robbie D. And they did. And they went on to do Gonzo. And I left. And I worked for a few different companies, Wicked and I don't know who else. And then I kind of landed at Adam and Eve. I did Naked Hollywood because it was it was following on with um, Sex in the City. Mm-hmm. It's like an L.A. version of Sex in the City. Mm-hmm. And I thought it kind of, I liked it because it kind of harkened back to my theater days of ensemble work because it was the same four girls all the time. And so I got to, God, I don't know, I think we did 15 episodes or something, like feature length, you know, 70 minutes, but ongoing episodic. It was hard because how many stories can you tell with them? I mean, the storylines, yeah. you know, had to follow the boyfriends and the this and the that. And they always have to end up in sex. That's the kind of the hardest thing about writing an adult movie, right? Like sex has to happen. In the so- first two minutes. Yeah. And it has to happen several times during a movie, like at least four scenes. And you have to justify and- it. You know, I was not a writer, except I became a writer and a really good writer because I was an actress and I was an editor. And... I, when I first came on, I was using other people's scripts and they were so horrible. And I would have to direct actors to do things that were simply not their character. Like this actor would never say what you're having, what you want me to have him say. So I just really started just doing things to justify scripts. But then they, then I really loved writing. But it was fun because I just got to play with different concepts. I actually played with a concept and oddly, ironically, Nina Hartley was the most conservative of the four, which of course we know she's not, but (laughs) she's so open and calm that I always felt like somehow Nina took a lot of fun out of things because she was just so open about everything, you know? You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Yeah. There was no guilt anywhere. There was no mystery. Nothing had to be hidden. Nothing had to be apologized for. It was just like, Everything was so accepted, and it was like, okay, well, I don't know. Maybe my Catholic guilt just finds that kind of boring. Right. But in this particular episode, which I've quoted to people a couple of times, they were going to a a alt party, kind of a a lifestyle alt party, and she didn't want to go, and they were giving her a hard time about it. And it was kind of that thing that is part of the message, I think, at least my message about my position in adult and and my position with women in adult is that, you know, if you choose to be celibate, completely fine. If you choose to be monogamous, I would not sh- throw shade on that. If you choose to be bisexual, great. If you're into the craziest alt stuff that we could imagine, that's fine too. What happens is, as you get incredibly progressive and you're into you're into lifestyle things or you're into fetish stuff, you tend to judge the women who are much more conservative. It's like, oh, what's wrong with them? You know? And there's nothing wrong with them. And that was that story of of if she if she's a person who wants to be monogamous and wants to have basically missionary sex, you cannot uh, judge her, her or define who she is by those choices. You have to respect those choices as much as she or anyone would respect the sexual choices you make. And that was, she got me, you know what? She actually, I would say, got me into the business because she, I interviewed her when we chose to do this documentary on the adult. I didn't, I left out that part, that third documentary that we couldn't figure out what the hell to do. I was now had those people editing at my studio. I was beginning to work with Vivid, and they said, well, let's do something on porn because you're already in the business. And I said, okay. And our very first shoot was AVN. And uh, it was AVN Awards. You're probably not old enough to remember Jonathan Morgan on that night with his booyah stuff. When he won an award, he was just drunk as hell when he got up there to accept it. But that night... We were there filming. It was our first thing we were going to film for the documentary, AVN in general, and the awards. And we were there after everyone was gone, and we were wrapping up. This is such an—I haven't told this story in like 20 years. It's such a bizarre story, but such a sort of a story that tells you so much about adult and how it affects people, like their limbic brain, their reptile brain, how how 
completely primal it affects them. We're standing there, and maybe I was interviewing Jonathan, and there was a security guard or somebody cleaning up tables, and he was picking up chairs and hurling them into the wall as hard as he could. And I thought, it's a little aggressive. And I have my camera because I was a shooter. So mm-hmm. I have my big beta cam on my shoulder and I'm looking through the viewfinder. I have this eye closed. And uh, that night, I remember Shishi LaRue had had a bunch of boys on there. He'd brought them on like dogs on their hands and knees with collars on on stage. That was the, the, um, that was the impetus of why this guy was freaking out. He's probably repressed homosexual, but whatever. Not, I don't know that. Anyway, he he was throwing this stuff around, and he went to walk past me, and I I could just see how agitated he was. And I turned and I said, "Hey, what's going on? How are you?" And he just turned and looked at me, and he said, "Time for you to to leave." He was a he was a naval guy too. He was a Navy officer, and he punched me punched me so hard, but I didn't see it coming because this side, I was looking at him through my camera and I had my eye closed, punched me so hard, but I was so loose that nothing happened. I just, my camera kind of fell off of, it was on my hand, but kind of hanging Mm -hmm. and knocked me into somebody. And then he ran. Ultimately, you know, shit would happen around that. But it was that he was so upset by what he had seen that night that he punched a woman Wow. I was probably in my 30s at that time. Wow. 35. Punched a woman. Who was just standing there full on. Didn't slap me, punched me. Because it it just motivated him so deeply and he was so angry about what he had seen. Which you can look around today and it's all over the place, yeah. right? It's the bro culture. Yeah. It just ang- something about it, something about women, something about comfortable sexuality just as opposed to submissive sexuality, just upsets. And why wouldn't it? We've had 150,000 years since we dropped out of the trees and there was a status quo. And boy, did it change like maybe 40 years ago. Yeah. And that you can't change people that fast. You just can't. They're just lost. White guys are just, I feel sorry for them. I talk about this all the time. I feel bad for white guys. I mean, their whole raison de tetra, their whole reason for existence has just changed. They're now not expected to be the providers because their wives probably make more money than they make. They have to give their wives an orgasm. She's not going to fake it anymore because she doesn't need to because she could go live on her own now. And I also think that like the, you know, and like jobs have become such an issue too, you know, like before you used to be able to just get out of high school, you didn't have to go to college, you get a good paying job that you could afford home for your family, you get a pension that would take care of you after you retired, like you could, you could make a life for yourself and that like doesn't exist anymore. It's the decimation of the middle class. You know, that's whatever it is. Three people, the three three wealthiest people in the country have more wealth than six than the lower 60% of this country. So that's a whole other topic. But anyway, so so yeah, that's how I got into adult and Nina. So Nina, I met at AVN. So here's Nina. She's standing there, her ass is a big thing. Everybody likes to take pictures with Nina's ass. So there's a real long line of guys out the door. And they're all dropping down beside Nina's butt. And Nina's got these high-waisted whatever things on, you know, where they're cut, this leotard's cut way up, and she's got this waist cincher. She's bending over in her best bunny arch, and they're taking pictures of her butt, but on her head side, I'm interviewing her. So it's sort of like being in a somebody in a horse costume, right? The ass is going one <laughs> way, the head's going another. And she said something very so profound. I'd come out of Central America where class was everything. Mm-hmm. You don't hear people, and you still to this day, don't hear people talk about class issues in the United States because we are theoretically a class society. It's how we were created, that there were no classes. Nothing could keep the poor kid from rising to become the president. Mm-hmm. And I said uh, something about, you know, I was very young in this and very naive. And I was, of course, asking the same questions that I've been asked now for 20 years about exploiting women. And she said, you know, it's not really about exploiting women. She said, it is a class issue. And that was such an odd thing to say, uh, such an odd expression to use. And I said, what are you talking about? And she said, the East Coast 
intellectuals, the women who drive the feminist movement, at that time Andrea Dworkin and company, all came from, you know, Wharton and Brown and all the upper class Ivy League women's schools. It's not, this is not about exploiting women and this is not so much about a religious issue or a moral issue. It's about a class issue because there is a feeling from the upper class intelligentsia on the East Coast that only bad girls from the wrong side of the track do this because they're because they're poor girls, they're white trash, and they're from the wrong side of the track. And she said, as you meet women in this business, you'll understand that that is not who these people are. Mm-hmm. Sure, there are some girls that come from lower, lower income families, but in general, throughout my career, the women I've met, you know, look, you meet some, you know, dumb dummies, and you meet some broken toys for sure, as you would if you walk into any club in LA as you would if you were a casting director and you were meeting actresses, you meet the same proportionate number of, you know, dingbats, right? And broken toys. But I've also met brilliant women in this business who made very conscious choices about why they wanted to be in this business and what they were doing. Uh, there's usually this feeling of being a bit renegade and rebellious that they just refuse to be defined by conventional stereotypes of what a woman is. And only when she said that, it's like everything lined up with my politics, which were very liberal, very progressive. Uh, I wasn't a well-read feminist, but I would consider having been raised without a father in my picture. I was I was just by default a, a feminist because I didn't know the traditional roles of men and women because I hadn't seen it in my life. And Everything lined up for me to to look at this and just say, I love this space. I think it's, I have a company, I haven't done anything with it, called Disruptive Propaganda. Brie ended up using a version of that. You're welcome. <laughs> disruptive Propaganda, because I believe from very early on that the most disruptive propaganda in a positive sense, propaganda in a positive sense, was pornography, because it struck at everything that you hold traditionally, the traditional role of women, the traditional role of religion and the patriarchy and who owns a woman's body or who controls a woman's body. Man, that's been going on for 6,000 years. And now this. When I had Penthouse, uh, I had channels all over the world. And we had channels in Turkey two channels, DSmart and Dogen, the two big platforms. And every night at midnight, from midnight to 5 a.m., my channel came on. And I was, you had a question, what are you most proud of? This may be one of the top three. Okay. I went to Istanbul many times because I had my clients there. And and I went during Ramadan and you would hear the call to prayer every four hours. And You'd have women in jeans and wonderful you know, clubs that were very Western, but you'd also have women in full burqas. And I used to contemplate the fact that on any given night in Old Town, a woman would be taking her burk off, her husband would be taking his clothes off, and at midnight they would turn the television on and there would be my channel. And that would be messaging to that woman in a burqa and no shade on burkas. That's your choice, that's your path, that's your path. But what I wanted it to message was, this is back to the Nina Hartley, Naked Hollywood thing, you get to be, you lady who just dropped her burqa, who's watching over her husband's shoulder, watching the girls of Naked Hollywood, it's you. You make those choices. You make the choices about your body. You make the choices about your sexuality. Nobody can tell you what to do. Not the mullah, not the rabbi, not the priest, not your father, your brother, and frankly, not your husband either. Mm. I just saw something on the news today about a woman who voted, she's 91 years old, just voted uh, well, this is, of course, old news, new news, whatever news it is. And she voted for the first time at 91. And when they were interviewing her, she said, because my husband didn't think I should vote, but he died last year. <laughs> <gasps> so I said, you know, I've been interviewed 10,000 times about, oh, aren't you exploiting women? And aren't you degrading women? And aren't you? And it's like, no, I'm not. I mean, yeah, you want to get into some deep rap about capitalism degrades workers in general because they have to get up in the morning and do things they don't want to do to make a living. Okay. That's a different conversation about capitalism. But you know, you don't say this about ballerinas who wreck their bodies or football players who wreck their bodies. But boy, when that triangle called your vagina comes into place, ooh, oh, now it's everybody's got to get hysterical about it and apoplectic about it. 
just because what? What? It's your vagina and someplace somebody told you that there was a virgin birth. And I, I don't even know what the theories are about why we all get so freaked out about it. But, but you know, as long as the woman is making a decision and it's her decision, the only time I've ever asked women to leave the set, and this is tough because capitalism comes into play. Do you want to be here? Or are you here because you're going to make money? It's a question that's hard to answer. But the only time I've ever had women leave a set was when I felt like there was a man standing around or in a car outside that was that she did really obviously did not want to be there and he yeah. was there. And I would pay her and say, take this money, put it in your pocket. It's your money. Get out of here. Yeah. Go find another way. Yeah. Because you shouldn't be here. You shouldn't be subjecting yourself to whatever's going on. Yeah. I had a woman show up one time. Remember Ed Powers? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. His cameraman fell out and he called me and said, I right, please come shoot for me. Ah. And I was like, okay. So I show up, girl shows up, husband's outside. And she was there and she told me she was so scared and shaking because he always, you know, he always wanted to have girls his first time shaking and scared. And I kept trying to put her at ease and saying, are you okay? What do you need? And she said, I'm just here because I don't have money for my babies, for diapers for my baby. Oh, God. And I said, oh, man. I said, okay, here's what I'm going to suggest. Um, I'm going to just give you your day rate, and I'm going to tell you to you go deal with what you need to deal with because I'm not going to shoot you. If that's, if that's what's going on, I'm not going to shoot you. And I went to Ed, and I said, you're going to pay her her day rate that time, like six or $700. And uh, and then we're going to let her go. We're going to call this a day. He goes, what? No. He started arguing with me. And I said, uh, okay, I'll tell you two things. I'm walking, so you're not going to have a cameraman. I'm going to go to AVN and whoever else wants to hear the story and talk about how exploitive this situation was. If you want to get into that with me, we can get into it. But you're going to pay her, and she's going to go buy baby diapers. And you're not going to say another fucking word to me about it. Of course, I was this tall, and he was like this tall. And he goes, okay. Intolerance to bullshit. There oh, yeah, it is. Intolerance there to bullshit. Is. And he did. And it was like... Nobody's ever been able to come up with a reason that resonated with me about why there is a problem in this industry. Some people have a drug addiction, probably not for very long because they won't last. Their body is their tool. They have to stay pretty healthy in this industry. They got to show up on time. They got to show up sober and do their lines. And so take that one off the table. No more than your average party girl in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. Are they working out some issue they had, you know, when they were 16 and they were, I don't know, had braces and acne? Maybe. I don't know. But aren't we all? Mm -hmm. um, the issue about social, the sort of social stigma of it is society's problem, not their problem. I, had, I went to Israel. We also had channels in Israel. And I went to Israel with uh, Layla Sin. Remember Layla Sin? She was oh, yeah, pet, of course. Of, pet of the year. Yeah. I, sh her, I shot her pet of the year layout with the tigers. Yeah. W uh, no, not, no, the one with tigers. Yes. You're yeah, right. You're yeah, right. I you shot, shot that. that. I did shoot Oh, that. my goodness. So we go to, we go to Israel. Her dad is an ultra conservative rabbi like i couldn't even go with her to her neighborhood because i wasn't i wasn't going to wear a veil and cover my shoulders right, right right super devout but we're there on a press tour it's cool cuz tel aviv is actually quite modern in many many ways most of the town is very progressive so i was interviewed by their 60 minutes let's call it pause was the interviewer's name and she kept saying, there's just so many disgusting things. I mean, you just see so many awful things that women are subjected to and blah, blah, blah. I mean, you must admit there's really horrible stuff. I said, pause. I can't apologize for the world. I can't apologize for what John Smith does in Kansas City with his girlfriend and posts it on, you know, uh, uh, Pornhub at that time. Uh, I can only talk about what I do. But, but, but in general, it's just such a degrading business. It's such horrible stuff. And she just kept on and on and finally I said, you know what, pause, you're 100% correct. I said, I, she said, nothing, you've never seen anything that shocked you. I said, actually, I did. I just saw something I thought was so shocking. It was an incestuous scene between a, a, a husband, wife, slash brother, sister. Their son, progeny of the incest, had been murdered and was laying, and was in a church, laying on an altar, and... Uh, the woman is so stricken with grief. The brother-husband is so enraged 
that it winds up with him raping her on the on the altar with the dead son lying there. And she went, see, I told you. And I said, I know. And Game of Thrones is pretty shocking to me. And she went, <laughs> she looked at me. I don't, I'm sure they cut it out, but she looked at me and went, oh, Kelly. And I said, oh, pause. <laughs> you know, you want to talk about what horrifies me. You know, things like CSI Special Victims Unit horrifies me. Uh, uh, every slasher movie that has some woman that's somehow sexualized and then is is then then there's some kind of violence. That stuff horrifies me. Because uh, it plays into the worst misogyny that that you could imagine. Uh, but what happens in adult, just because it's sex, it's it's ridiculous. Yeah, I agree. I mean, and that's like a huge reason why I started this podcast. I wanted people to meet the people who work on the sets and behind the scenes and the actresses who are clearly have agency, are in charge of their bodies, their careers. They come into this industry with a very specific, you know, idea in mind. They have a business plan. They have a brand. Like you cannot meet Angela White and have a conversation with her and think that that girl is a victim. Right. Like there's no way. Right. You know what I mean? And there's so many women like her. And I just felt like people need to like hear from them, right? Because it's everybody who's, everybody who has an opinion about the adult industry and is talking about how terrible it is and how horrible it is for women are people who have had zero, usually people who've had zero experience with it. And then of course there's people who've had bad experiences in porn and that absolutely happens. It's not right it for everybody. Everywhere, right. And sometimes you fall in with the wrong people. You have a bad agent or whatever. And those stories are absolutely valid, but it's unfair to take those stories and paint the entire industry with that brush. As inherently... Uh, a place that is dysfunctional and uh, and misogynistic to women, um, and you know people that people that believe that to me are more discriminatory and oppressive to women than anyone that's ever approached this business, and it's because you make an assumption that women in general are so stupid mm -hmm. and so weak. open, weak. Don't get me into a whole conversation about the Me Too movement because it, it does bridge into a space of self-victimization. So don't come into this industry or don't look at this industry and underestimate the intelligence and the agency of the women in this business because they're not these mindless you know, victims that have had their brains surgically removed and they're just sitting there as these sort of sexual vessels. I mean, it's it's horrific that you would ever believe that, and it's more of a testimony to the people who uh, have that to, have that position with adult that women have to be protected. Yeah, because they're I'll projecting. Be, I'll, project, them, I'll be your protector. They're like I feel like they're often projecting themselves yes, onto that. Absolutely, one hundred percent. This actually leads into my question for you about as a CEO and as as a as a female boss, like not even the adult industry, but experiencing misogyny in, in, if you've ever experienced that in that role. And I was talking to somebody about misogyny and, and, and how, if that's an issue. And so I'm working, you know, I mentioned this platform that I'm working on. So I'm working actually like in, I'm working in a tech company. So I'm like working in tech now, which is weird. And I'm like literally one of the only women mm -hmm. in a large group of men. And I'm very comfortable with that. I'm often the only woman. I'm sure that you've experienced mm -hmm. this as well. One of my favorite um, stories about like how apparent that was to me was when I was shooting for Mind Geek. Mm -hmm. They're ALO now, but I was shooting for Twisties and they had a huge producers meeting. This is years ago. And they flew everyone out to Montreal, all the directors and the main producers for Brazzers and Reality Kings and all those companies. I was the only girl there. The oh my God. only one. And I was, you know, and I'm used to being surrounded by men and I'm totally comfortable with it. And I remember we went out to dinner and we took a picture afterwards and I wore a pink dress <laughs> and it's me in the middle and like 25 guys in suits. And it almost looked like, like the beginning of a gangbang or something. And I was just like, oh my God, you know? And it, it was only at that moment that it kind of struck me. And mis for me, misogyny I experience it. We all do. Right. But it doesn't, I feel like it doesn't really affect me that much. And it's often like water off a duck's back because for me, it doesn't translate. It's not real. I don't internalize it. I don't believe it at all. 
So somebody tries to tell me that I'm incapable of doing something because I'm a woman or tries to suggest that, it's irritating to me, but it doesn't penetrate me because it's not real. Mm -hmm. Because I was raised by a woman and in a family where it was never suggested to me that I couldn't, couldn't do, do something, something because I'm a woman. That was never on the table. I was never raised with that kind of belief. So I don't believe that as an adult. And I think that a lot of times women who look and men who look at this industry and look at the women in the industry and think about how they're all victims um, were raised with this idea that that women are less than they men. saw women victimized around them and thought that that was the only relational right. thing that could happen. Was there misogyny around me? Probably, but like you, but probably even more brain dead. I was probably more brain dead to it. I just never noticed it. Mm. I never paid attention to it. Ron Vogel said to me when he first met me, and I was probably shooting camera uh, like on a, th a third time ever on an adult movie. He said to me, you're a woman, you can't shoot camera. And I just looked at him and I said, Shot in war zones, you old fuck. Shut up. I mean, I <laughs> like I didn't. I just was like, who the fuck are you? I did, I never really noticed it if it was going on. The only time I that I was really confronted with it was in the hostile takeover of Penthouse mm. because that happened without getting into all the details. But that happened. My COO, CFO, appropriately named Don Slaughter. Uh, who I relied on so heavily and trusted so much uh, was uh, sort of working with someone else behind the scenes to buy my loan and call my loan. And that's how the whole mishgoss of the demise of me as the owner of Penthouse happened. But he, in retrospect, when we get into lawsuits and discovery and you start looking at people's emails and listening to, you know, people start doing uh, 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 depositions, recounting conversations, it was that he was uh, incensed that a woman would own penthouse. He couldn't believe that he wanted he wanted his testicles sitting in that chair, not my vagina. Now, ultimately, he partnered with somebody who was much more diabolical than him and much more um, business savvy and vulture capital savvy. And he ended up nowhere near penthouse, so everything that he wanted sort of blew up in the process. But uh, that was purely from my perspective, purely a misogynistic move. Mm. And the person that would come in later, uh, the, the company that would buy the buy Penthouse, uh, ultimately end up with Penthouse, also had uh, the person that worked out front for them, not the actual owner, but the per, sort of the front man, I think probably had a bit of a mommy complex. And that was we didn't get along at all. And I think he was just, he was just very comfortable with women in a certain role. And I was not in that role. And that was right. really problematic. So that was the only part of my life where I noticed that as being actively in play and a real sort of subtextual motivator for what was happening. Mm. But other than that, it was probably all around me and I just never noticed it. Just never saw it. Yeah. And had I noticed it, it would have been just, yeah, fuck off. Yeah, you know? exactly. Exactly. So, you just, Hire somebody else, or yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so shifting gears to you own a beautiful home mm -hmm. that many people rent out for adult movies. Yeah, uh, I have shot there many a time myself. Yep, yep. Uh, tell us a little bit about that because this is actually something that I've had quite a few people ask me about where you shoot um and why is it so why is it always the same house <laughs> like you know and why yeah. and then when i tell people it's actually hard to find locations to it shoot is. in in la cuz most people don't want porn well why so maybe tell us a little bit about what it's like well, i can tell you why they wouldn't but <laughs> uh you know i didn't plan it it wasn't like oh uh you know it's interesting without getting into my philosophy and my metaphysical philosophies uh, I bought the property just because I fell in love with it. It's Chumash Indian ground. It's got this amazing topography with the rocks. And it was, back to my fixer-up nature, when I, when I went out to see it, it was like a junkyard. The house was falling down. It was horrible. I looked at all these other places, and then my my realtor drives me into this place, which was chain link fence and rusty cars. And he he got in, he went, "Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I should never have brought you here." And I just went, "I want it." And he went, "What?" And I said, "I want it." He said, "Where would you live? Look at it." And I said, "I cast, I'll throw up a teepee or a yurt or something." But I just fell in love with the rocks. Mm. 
and I fell in love with the energy of it without getting metaphysical about it. And and then I spent 20 years and every dollar I ever had just sort of, I don't even feel like I own it. I feel like I'm the shepherd of the land, you know, that I'm just there to 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 make it as serene and calm and as much of a sanctuary as possible. But at that time, I was doing some work on it, and I I thought, you know, I never had a thought to shoot there, you know, not for any reason, but I just didn't think to do it. And uh, I had penthouse; I was making gazillions of dollars. And uh, but I thought, you know, something, something out of the blue, something totally unexpected. I don't know. I get hit by a bus. Who knows? And I can no longer work. I can't do what I was doing or what I am doing. I couldn't foresee what it would be. I could never have foreseen the way it would go down. Um, But I need a backup. And at that time, you know, I'd spent 10 years, 15 years in the business hustling to get cool locations, hustling to get user friendly locations that didn't drive you crazy. And I thought I should make this house a house that's shootable just in case that day ever comes. Well, the day came. You know, I went from making a gazillion dollars to making zero dollars and having no money in the bank because I had spent it all on lawyers fighting the takeover. And uh, I started doing shoots. Look, can I tell you it's my favorite thing to do? No, it's not because I have to get up three hours before the shoot. I have to put all the animals up. I have to lint roller everything and vacuum everything and light candles so nobody smells the dogs and nobody smells the cats and mat, 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 mat. And then, then the shoot comes in. But these people are, for the most part, my friends. Um, I do a lot now that's not adult. Uh, I do uh, uh, ancient aliens a lot. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, They've that's been so great. Sitting there for years and years. Oh, that's great. They're one of my one of my top clients, and I love them. Amazing. I mean, they're friends of mine. Who's Who's the Giorgio. guy? That, is that the main the guy who owns it? With the hair. He he also. Well, hold on. No, you're talking about the girls next door. Is that what you're about to say? No. So the guy. So the the founder. So the production company behind. Ancient Aliens is um, Prometheus. Yeah. And Prometheus also did, um, oh, you know, they do Unexplained. They do the uh, Mystery of Oak Island. They do Skinwalker Ranch. They do all these, you know, kind of yeah. alieny, spooky things. But the guy that was the original founder of Prometheus who passed away during COVID, um, his first job was Girls Next Door. That's where he came from. He was Hefner's friend. Okay. And he was the producer of Girls Next Door. Oh, okay. So I used to tell ancient aliens, don't be shocked by what I do. Your daddy came from <laughs> Girls Next Door. Well, Kelly, thank you so much for coming on. We do have a couple of questions for you from my Patreon members, which yes. we're going to answer in a separate segment. But in the meantime, can you tell everybody where they can find you online? Yeah, are so you, you can't. Yeah, I am are online. You on media? I am online. I am online. Well, I got off Twitter because I can't stand Elon Musk, but um, he's such a dork. But um, but I, what is your Twitter handle? I, I don't even know if it still exists. It's I just delete, delete, delete. I don't even remember what it was. I don't think it's there anymore. Oh, so it isn't. I hate Elon Musk. That no, was I was being that facetious was earlier today. I really thought that you got that username, and I was very excited. No, but for I you. should try. I feel like he's no, not I think I will. That. I think it's been taken. <laughs> How about I hate Elon Musk one 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 two five six? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> no. Uh, so what we didn't talk about is I I got into animal rescue and that's where my thrust is. That's where I'm focusing and I'm focusing on opening ten spay neuter clinics because now I want to get out of rescue. So I have to spay neuter the entire city, at least the animals, <laughs> the entire city of Los Angeles just to get out of rescue. But um, uh, it's the Animal Rescue Alliance is my um, is my rescue. And uh, Facebook is the uh, Animal Rescue Alliance and Farm Sanctuary, and Instagram is Tara Animals, and TikTok's Tara Animals. And at one time on TikTok, I had millions of followers because I had a very funny kitten named Franklin. And I was like, anyway, it's a long story, but yeah, there it is. I love that. And I actually uh, recently got a cat from her, uh, Grayson, that we renamed Prince, and he's lovely. He is My lovely. Daughter loves him. He is lovely. He has a really. Sweet he wasn't cat. lovely before he came to you. He was a bit of a of a delinquent, but yeah, I told you he was a delinquent. I mean, he still does the zoomies in the middle of the night, and but we, you know, he sleeps downstairs because he's got to go after the the mice. Masha loves him too. Yes, <laughs> he's a good cat. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on, You're Kelly. Welcome. 
We're going to run through these Patreon questions in a minute, but that'll be a separate segment, which you can access if you're a member of my Patreon, patreon.com slash hollyrandallunfiltered. Um, Thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you on the next one. Bye.